usually a pretty quiet Hank member, but I really wanted to, to step up and just remind folks that this is a very, very um, crucial bit of, uh, uh, bit of legislation to oppose. And I guess I say bit because it's on three pages. That's it. And um, that means both uh, maybe that it's simple uh, in terms of its goals, um, gentrification and, and uh, destruction of affordable housing, and uh, also that it has plenty of loopholes. Uh, I encourage everybody, if they want to, to actually look at it and, and read it, and you'll see some pretty astonishing stuff that, in my mind, um, lays clear that there's really, a, uh, in my opinion, a, a lack of, of honest intent on the part of Wiener and Farrell. Um, they have their agenda, and they're attempting to ram it through. The final vote is going to be uh, the first Tuesday in March, so time is of the essence here. Those that have not written to um, D5 Supervisor London Breed um, about their concern over this legislation, uh, about their desire to actually protect affordable rental housing in, in this city, um, and class and race diversity in this city to protect that as well, then please do so. Please, please um, write and email and make sure that, that London knows of your concern. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. Um, and uh, there's ongoing negotiations. I don't have anything startling to report. There was uh, a sit down with um, Leland Ye, uh, pro tenant folks, yesterday, today, he was sitting down with Plan C, which are the speculator gentrifier folks. And, uh, Norman Ye. What? Or the meeting was with Norman. Norman, sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and, um, and then tomorrow is a, a sit down with everybody uh, where there will be continued negotiations. But we really need to keep up the pressure. Um, so please uh, write to London Breed and let her know if you're What's Thanks. the number of, when you call London Breed, what's the number you refer to? I have it in or my address legislation. Book. Oh, oh, I think everybody knows it as the Wiener. Um, uh, I mean, correct me if, if there's some easier handle for it, but... Well, there was a final number, but it's a uh, condo okay. conversion. Okay. Yeah, you can refer to it as condo conversion or the okay. Wiener feral legislation. That's how everybody's referring to it. Okay, but you have to say TIC because they have others. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> was it your email that said that she was enthusiastically supporting this? Yes, she is a she is uh, she is a solid vote. Now she may, depending on how other supervisors line up, you know, it's, there's always that search for for the moving target of the center and where the center is going to line up, and everybody lines up to the right and the left of that uh, is maybe one way to think about it. But uh, but certainly she's a solid vote for it. Um, a lot of money was spent getting her into office, and and she, you know, is going to heed that money. Um, so so I, I think that's another argument for us to, uh, uh, you know, not in any disrespectful tone or, or name calling, but, but to really, uh, from a positive point of view, remind her that we are deeply concerned about the, uh, um, the probability, <laughs> the, the horrendous probability for gentrification and mass evictions should this legislation pass as it stands right now. Um, those will certainly, certainly be effects of this legislation if it were to pass in its current little three-page format. Um, and, and anyone that wants to can talk with me afterwards, too. So one of the excuses they were using for the legislation is that people in tenancy in common were having a hard time with their mortgages, whatever. Um, I heard an idea that that the city, using Prop C funds, could purchase from the tenancy in commons and uh, use that for affordable housing. Has there been any? Um, I haven't heard any movement to that effect. I just want to lay to rest that that is not an argument based in fact 
Mm -hmm. um, there is no documentation out there. Uh, um, research has actually been done to run all the addresses in the condo pool and try to correlate those with all the addresses that have gotten foreclosure notices that are anywhere in the foreclosure pipeline, I mean the whole pipeline. And uh, I was told by, I'm a long time volunteer staffer at the Tenants Union, full disclosure. Uh, and um, I was told by Ted just the other day, zero correlation, <laughs> zero, <laughs> zero point zero 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 correlation. Um, there is a, a article that appeared two days ago written by Dean Preston that says that um, there were 10 notices of foreclosure, kind of the first step in the pipeline um, for buildings three to six units. Uh, whether any of those were ticks, um, that is unknown. Uh, they could just be rental properties, income properties, but exactly 10 um, of those buildings came up as flagged for uh, foreclosure notices. So that uh, anyone can honestly stand in front of anyone else and say that the issue is um, housing stability for tick owners is lying to your face. One of our most active supervisors, and he seems to have a knack for winding up on the cover of publications all over the city. I think that's dying down now. Thank uh, you very much for coming. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And, you know, I, uh, even though we are elected by, uh, by, by district, um, and we, of course, you're representing the district always first and foremost. We're one city, and I think it's really important for all supervisors to know what's going on um, around the city because we're constantly being called on to vote on things that affect either the whole city or a different part of the city, and so I think that's our responsibility. So I'm, um, I'm happy to, to be here, and I, of course, have a good conversation uh, tonight. And I, I am on next door for my, uh, for my um, neighborhood, which I'm technically in uh, Corona Heights, even though I always consider myself the Castro, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's been uh, great just seeing um, what people post and whether it's, you know, their robberies happen at X location and to be alert or different services that people are offering. It's actually, I think, quite uh, helpful. Um, so I just wanted to give a, a, an update on a few things that I think are happening at City Hall, a few things that, that I'm doing that I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that anyone uh, has. I, uh, 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 being a supervisor, my, my predecessor, Bevan Dusty, always used to say that it was the best job in the world. I heard him say that publicly quite a bit, and I always thought he was just saying it. And, and now that I'm uh, in the position for a little over two years, um, I know that he was actually uh, being quite truthful um, because it is an amazing uh, opportunity. It's a difficult job, um, but you are, we are all working on interesting issues 365 days a year, and that, it's, it's great just being able to work uh, with the community to try to solve problems and make things uh, better for people. So uh, it's just it's amazing. I'm very grateful to District 8 for, uh, for sending me to, to City Hall. Um, a few things I wanted to mention. One is uh, the budget. Um, <coughs> our budget process is uh, getting started. Uh, we passed the budget in, in July, and so the next uh, three or four months are going to be very uh, active. And um, our budget picture is much more uh, positive this year than it's been uh, in a very, very uh, long time. The first year that I uh, was on the board on the budget committee, our initial budget uh, deficit estimate was something like somewhere between 300 and 400 million dollars. Um, now I think we're, um, if not under 100 million dollars projection, it's close, and it always gets smaller because as especially um, with new revenues coming in, it tends to shrink. So I have a feeling we may not have much of a deficit at all um, when push comes to shove. And so uh, last year we were able to do a budget um, without um, uh, cuts uh, to critical services, which was the first time that that had happened in a very uh, long time. And one of the things that we've been able to do, um, uh, which we're going to continue to do, is start funding police academy classes. Um, for about five years, uh, give or take, um, the city essentially had no police academy classes. And so full staffing of the police department was 2,971 officers. Um, we peaked at about 2,000 uh, for like a minute uh, in the mid-2000s. And we're now down to um, about 1,750 because 
Um, we hired a lot of officers in the late 70s and early 80s, um, and so a lot of those officers are um, eligible for retirement, and so we've been shrinking as a department, and uh, we, we can't let that uh, keep happening. So uh, we um, added in last year's budget, and I think we have a consensus, to have three academy classes in every single fiscal year uh, going forward, which will help us first stabilize and um, and not shrink anymore, and then ultimately uh, grow again. Um, and so I'm very optimistic about that, but I know it's uh, challenging. I know in my district, when I the, there are actually four stations that are uh, have parts of District 8, and all of them uh, struggle. They don't have enough uh, uh, beat offs. And so eventually we'll be able to uh, reverse that. Um, we also, um, um, one thing that I uh, fight for every year in the budget is uh, to get more money for uh, tree maintenance, especially for street trees, uh, where the city, um, I'm sure, has anyone got a, a notice that you're getting a tree turned over to you for, uh, for maintenance? Well, that's, uh, I haven't seen that in a while. The city um, is turning over all of the city-maintained trees on sidewalks to property owners to maintain. Um, it's about um, about 60% of those trees are already maintained by adjacent property owners. It'll be close to 100% within a few years. And that's because for a long time, we've underfunded tree maintenance. And so the city, uh, DPW, just has less and less funding to take care of those trees, so they're starting to turn them over to uh, property owners who may not have planted them, may not want them, may not be able to afford them, may not have any physical ability to take care of them. And so, um, it's, for me, it's a priority to really change that and get the city uh, back in charge. And we're trying to think of ways how we can have a dedicated funding stream for our urban forest, which is important for the environment, important for our quality of life, um, important for stormwater uh, runoff. Uh, and we, we, we just have to um, reverse course there because it's incredibly um, important. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, transportation. Um, uh, it was a huge uh, focus for me. Um, and, you know, for, for me, being a transit person um, doesn't mean that we um, just punish people for driving and try to make it impossible for people to drive. <coughs> what it means is that we offer alternatives to driving, good alternatives to people. So recognizing that there are some people who are always going to need to drive, whether it's because of their job or their family or physical limitations, they will need to drive. Um, but there are other people who maybe have a car, um, but maybe if they had good alternatives, if they had uh, a great, uh, great public transportation system, easy access to taxis, a really good car sharing system, all these alternatives, they would get rid of their cars. And it's for that portion of the population that don't really necessarily need a car, and if you give them good options, they'll drive less, or they won't drive at all. And so that's what transit first means to me. Um, and so I've been working uh, very, very hard to try to uh, build support for better maintenance at Muni. Um, Muni has underfunded its maintenance for many years. We have all, we as a city have underfunded Muni maintenance for, a year, for years. And we're really paying the price on that now. We see a lot of breakdowns, not enough vehicles, um, doors that break down, portion systems that break down, signals and switches um, on, the, on the subway, um, even on the surface level. And um, it's really important that we <coughs> recommit to investing in Muni. And so um, I don't, there's not enough political support uh, for transit investment uh, in the city. And so one of the things that uh, I have asked uh, the MTA to do is to start providing a monthly report on the deferred maintenance on the total system, um, on how many uh, uh, vehicles break down and how long on average it takes to get them back into service, because it's actually for some vehicles, quite a long time. How many subway meltdowns <coughs> happen? And for when those meltdowns happen, what is the economic productivity loss for the city? And a few other metrics, just really putting out a, a monthly report which we'll publicize to the public and try to build more support to make sure that we're supporting our public transportation system. Uh, we also need to really improve car sharing. And um, right now, our uh, planning code actually makes it difficult for people building new developments to put publicly accessible car sharing spaces in their development. Um, and that's something we need to encourage. So uh, the Board of Supervisors just passed legislation that I um, authored to make it easier for developers to put those publicly accessible car sharing spots uh, in their developments, which I think will be a real benefit um, to a lot of neighborhoods. 
Um, and then I, I just want to um, uh, touch on um, another focus of mine, uh, process uh, reform and making the city or easier, our city processes easier for citizens to interact with. Um, I passed a couple of pieces of legislation last year to help small businesses navigate the permit process. Um, we had a uh, really Byzantine system for permitting restaurants, cafes, bakeries, um, 13 different uh, classifications of restaurants. Um, and it was so uh, it was so overly complicated that there were you could actually have a permit that would allow you to serve a bagel um, cold but not toasted. <laughs> and the planning department could technically compensate your toaster if you toasted the bagel. Or the, you were allowed to a kind of permit where you could serve ice cream in a cup but not in a cone. And these regulations had accumulated over the years for good intentions because we, you know, we would, something would happen and so we do an amendment to the planning code um, to address it. And over 30 years, you get this sort of um, conglomeration, a mishmash, exactly. And so uh, we simplified that by um, collapsing it down to three um, class categories um, of restaurants, and I think it's already having beneficial impacts. Because you know, fundamentally, as a city, we shouldn't be telling restaurants, no, you have to serve this kind of food, but not that kind of food. Um, food is such an evolving, cutting edge kind of thing that you want to give you know, entrepreneurs the flexibility to deal with that. And then um, the other piece of legislation was around secondhand dealers. Um, uh, antique shops, second hand bookstores, vintage clothing stores. You know, we say that we want to really embrace and have more unique neighborhood businesses and less formula retail. Well, then you have to make it easy for those unique neighborhood businesses to start and exist. And for those second hand dealers, um, we treated them all as if they were the worst kind of pawn shops. Um, and so they had to pay a $1,500 permit fee. Um, they had to go and get fingerprinted and have a mugshot taken at the Hall of Justice. Um, they technically had to keep a daily log of every single customer, including name and description of the person, and turn it into the police department every day. Um, and so, uh, needless to say, that there was not a very high compliance level uh, with these regulations. And so, all of a sudden, we started hearing in my, in my district from different you know, antique shops and used bookstore and you know a business clothing store. They were getting these letters from the police department saying you're committing a misdemeanor, and you know you better pay up now and start complying. So we took a look and we ended up uh, repealing the bulk of that uh, ordinance. So there are certain kinds of goods that might be more likely to be stolen goods, like electronics or jewelry, where they still have a higher um, reporting threshold, but for other kinds of stores, um, uh, we eliminated, either eliminated the permit or reduced it dramatically so it's only like $100 and you don't have to do the reporting uh, anymore. So I thought that seemed as a good result to our neighborhood businesses. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll leave it there and I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Well, I suppose you need more controversial legislation, but would you support some kind of a license fee for bicycle riders? Um, if I thought that that would actually improve <coughs> safety, um, I, I would consider that, but I actually don't think um, it would. Um, I think what it would do is require us to set up a new bureaucracy in the city, which would probably end up costing us as much or more than we would take in. Um, I think that we need better enforcement on our roads overall. And I think bikes that violate the rules of the road should be um, should be ticketed. Uh, same with same with cars. <coughs> and I know that uh, we actually don't have enough traffic enforcement period in, in the city and we see it every day uh, on our roads. Um, I, I will say that I do know some cyclists who have gotten uh, tickets for rolling stop signs and, and other uh, uh, infractions. So I think that the police department, there has been a shift in mentality whereas I think they used to be I'm nervous about enforcing against cyclists, but I think that there's a shift in mentality, including for the bike coalition, that if you violate the law, you know, people have to follow the law and be safe. To me, that's the best use of our resources, improving enforcement. That's just my take on it. In our neighborhood, up on the hill, is a housing project that is being proposed. Neighbors are, uh, yes, neighbors are against it although we all say we need more housing. On the other end, in this close by, is an apartment building that is being alistar, and renters are saying they need housing. 
Yeah. So what is what guides you when you have to make a decision like this? Mm -hmm. um, well, starting with the um, the eviction, the L I, I don't support the Ellis Act. I think that it is uh, um, a law that um, has been, you know, especially in those larger buildings, um, it, it's a it's a big problem. Um, we have tried repeatedly in Sacramento to reform the Ellis Act. Uh, Mark Leno had legislation which I supported um, to at least require um, that you can't just buy a building and then immediately sell it for pretty modest reform. You know, say you have to at least have owned it for five years. Seems like very common sense uh, to me as a minimal kind of first step reform. And um, he could not get any traction in the legislature to get that uh, through. Um, so my understanding is that in Sacramento, um, the, the Ellis Act is just doing any kind of reform to it is extremely hard. Actually, Mark Leno was able to get through a change. This is like the only thing that really made it through. So you can't use the Ellis Act on SROs. Um, but that, that's the only thing um, uh, folks have been able to get uh, through. We have passed quite a bit of legislation in, Sac in San Francisco um, to try to um, minimize Ellis Act evictions or to have repercussions if you Ellis Act the building. Um, and some of those have stood up in court, some of those have been struck down uh, in court. So for example, if you Ellis Act the building, um, you, um, there are dramatic restrictions or even a ban uh, placed on the ability to condo convert uh, that building. In some parts of the city, if you Ellis Act the building, you can't, you can't then put a garage into the building. So we've tried around the edges to address the Ellis Act issue but fundamentally, Sacramento, you, we need legislation to move uh, through Sacramento. Um, in terms of the Crestmont project, I will admit that even though I've heard, I, I know that it's a project that's out there that is being, um, that is very controversial in the community. I don't know all the details of it. That project may come to the board. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen with it at the commission. It can be appealed to the board. Um, and I would certainly um, take a close look at it uh, then. Um, you know, I, um, uh, when it comes to these kinds of appeals that we deal with at the board, um, I think it's very, very important to, you know, take into account what the community thinks. Uh, so I'd like to tell you about a couple of things that, that are in his legislation, and then I'm going to ask for, make a motion and ask his members to vote on it, uh, to oppose his legislation. One is that he's put in his legislation that the first time a project is approved, if you're going to appeal it, you have to appeal within 20 days of the first approval. Now, the first approval would also be changed to be that any city department or agency in their office could approve a project. And good luck finding out about it. So we say that it should be the last Improved along the way, more stakeholders have a chance to weigh in. Um, we also think that his the deadlines for appeal are way too short. Twenty days is really difficult. Projects uh, are in the works for a year or two or three years, and then we're given twenty or thirty days to try to understand it and appeal. So we think that there should be a minimum of thirty days, and on bigger projects, sixty days to appeal. And that we feel that the Board of Supervisors should uh, continue to be an appealable to body. And he wants to take that away. Again, there's just been a few cases every year that go to the full board. So they don't need a lot of protection that from that. Creep. What we need to do is protect the community from developers. <laughs> so I propose, I would like to make a motion that the Haight-Ashbury Neighborhood Council oppose changes to CEQA procedures proposed by Supervisor Scott Wiener. Second. Second. 